Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine Podcast. And we've got Michael Hoffman again uh, on the line from the Peter Mac uh, Institute in Melbourne. And um, being also in Melbourne, um, uh, we're very happy because we've got our COVID numbers down to zero, uh, virtually zero, uh, from a big second wave. So that's a great achievement. It'd be nice to see other places hopefully get around that. But um, the other thing that we're excited about is uh, the a and which is on at the moment, and um, and uh, uh, Mike uh, has uh, has ha- actually actually presented some material at the a and and uh, and some different things. So why don't you tell us about what what you've been presenting there, and t- tell us a bit of t- tell people who don't know a little bit about Peter Mack and what you do there. Thanks, Rob. Uh, great to be with you. It would have been even better to be in Vienna with you, but yeah, maybe not. not maybe not right at the moment. Melbourne's quite a good place now yes. that we've come out of lockdown. Uh, so I work at, uh, I'm a nuclear medicine physician at uh, Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. We're a big uh, cancer hospital in uh, at Melbourne. It's uh, half a hospital and half a, a research institute with a lot of uh, basic science uh, laboratories. But we do have a very big nuclear medicine department with uh, four PET CT scanners, a uh, Radio Pharmacy and a big uh, Theranostics uh, service. And it's quite a new hospital. It was only opened uh, four years ago. We moved to a new uh, facility. So we have a, a really nice uh, Theranostics uh, unit where we can treat up to sort of uh, six people at the same time, all uh, nicely uh, shielded, very comfortable for the patients, uh, big windows. Uh, it's fantastic. And uh, yeah, we've been busy at EANM this year. There are nine oral presentations from the wider Peter Mac uh, group, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, can tell you eight out of the nine of those are in the prostate cancer domain, uh, which tells you a little bit about maybe what's big in nuclear medicine at the moment, but also a major focus of uh, research uh, at Peter Mac. And the other one is on uh, AI image interpretation that I know uh, you have an interest in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about what you what, what some of those uh, presentations show. Yeah, so we had, uh, I did two talks, which was actually in a session called Best Clinical Trials. And uh, there were five or six clinical trials uh, presented in sort of rapid fire, 10 minutes each. I think it would have been a, a really great session if we were there live. And I represented two big trials that have read out this year, which are actually Australian multi-center uh, trials, uh, one an imaging trial and one a therapy trial. Uh, so some of your listeners may know about these. The first one was the pro-PSMA trial. Now uh, this was a prospective randomized trial of PSMA PET compared to CT bone scan for staging men with newly diagnosed uh, prostate cancer published in the Lancet in March. And it showed a, a superior accuracy for PSMA PET of 92% uh, compared to 65%. So a pretty definitive uh, outcome in this big randomized uh, trial. And the other randomized trial I presented was the therapy trial. This was uh, presented at uh, ASCO, the big oncology trial in the middle of the year. This was a therapy randomized trial, a similar network of sites, uh, 11 sites uh, around Australia. And we randomized men with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer to either uh, lutetium PSMA or carbazitaxel chemotherapy. And this was the first randomized trial of lutetium PSMA globally. So a lot of interest in this trial. And uh, we just reported the initial results, which was the primary endpoint of PSA response. And men randomized to lutetium PSMA had a drop in PSA more than 50% in 66% of men compared to uh, 37% of men in the carbazitaxel arm. So that's a big difference between the two arms, a 29% uh, greater PSA 50 response rate with uh, uh, lutetium. And we also reported the grade, uh, the toxicities, and there were less side effects with uh, lutetium. So that's fantastic. You've got higher activity uh, and lower side effects. And we've just actually done the next analysis of the therapy trial, which will trigger our uh, publication point. Uh, so we hope to uh, get that out in a manuscript towards the end of this year or the beginning of uh, next year. So there were two clinical trials in the clinical trial section. Now I did a plenary on is Theranostics the future of uh, nuclear medicine? And uh, I won't summarize that, but I just gave a 10 minute sort of perspective uh, on my views on, you know, where we're going with Theranostics in nuclear medicine, because I think it is going to be a big part of the future of nuclear medicine. You know, probably our practice at Peter Mac 
you know, one third of my work is therapy, one third is pet imaging, and one third is uh, research. And that's a that's a really nice mix. It gives a lot of variety, even within a really narrow area of oncologic uh, nuclear medicine. And then in terms of original science, uh, a collaborator from Sydney, uh, who's a health economist, Richard de Arbro Lorenko, uh, who's a health economist at Crest, the Centre for uh, Health Research, Economics and Outcomes, uh, presented a a uh, further endpoint of that pro-PSMA trial uh, embedded in this big randomized trial of PSMA PET compared to CT bone scan, we carefully costed up, at least in the Australian context, how much a PSMA PET scan costs. And the data we collected at all the 11 sites was really very detailed. So we collected, you know, the gallium generators, all the reagents, uh, cartridges, automated synthesis unit, names of the HPLC machines, how long the chemist was spending making it up because it was all made in hospital radio pharmacies. And then we also costed up how long the scan took, how long were they actually on the scanner. And we did that for the control arm as well, for the CT bone scan. Uh, so obviously if you have a bone scan, the trace is injected, you wait about four hours and then you do the image. And then you come back the next day and have a CT scan. So from a health economics perspective, that's quite costly for the patient. They're losing time off work. You know, it's also taking a lot of staff uh, time, whereas a PSMA PET is all over in 90 minutes uh, in terms of time. Uh, so it's a lot faster. So we costed up both the cost of doing the scan, uh, the cost of doing the PET scan and the time taken. And we actually showed that uh, PSMA PET CT was a little bit cheaper than doing two tests, a CT and a bone scan. And the bone scans were done with spec CT. And this was an Australian based costing. It may not be applicable to sure. our listeners in the US or, or Europe, and that was the acute cost. And our health economists call that a dominant scenario where you've got a new test that's both uh, better, as in it's more accurate, and it's cheaper. Uh, so it's, it's a double win. Uh, and as part of that health economics analysis, there was also some decision tree modeling around uh, costs of diagnosing a nodal metastasis or a distant metastasis, and some more complex Markov modeling where we look at downstream effects of uh, the more accurate imaging and we can come up with, you know, cost per quality of life year of introducing oh. uh, this new modality. And, you know, the health economists found this data to be uh, really compelling. Uh, so we hope this data will be used to support. Uh, there is a MSAC application in Australia. MSAC is the group that uh, assess new technologies uh, to give them a, a reimbursement in Australia. And they're currently having a good look at uh, PSMA PET and the pro-PSMA trial is a core uh, part of that. Uh, and uh, hopefully this health economics analysis will help as well. Yeah, you need those a... studies in order, for, in order for, in the case of Australia, where we've got a uh, publicly funded healthcare system to justify it. But even in the case of the USA, where you've got a private insurance system, you still need to, um, you still need to justify it. it it's, insurance companies like, like to see whether they're actually going to save themselves money. I mean, can this data that you've accumulated in Australia, just adjust the cost, I guess, be looked at in terms of things like the NICE guidelines in, in the UK, where they do a similar thing quite often? I know they've done that with myocardial perfusion scanning and all sorts of things. Do you think, uh, do you think that you had interest, um, particularly the a &M, with uh, the NICE people to see if they're going to use that data in their analysis? Yeah, look, I hope they do. Uh, no doubt they can just tweak it to their, to the, to their local needs. Uh, for complex reasons, PET CT seems quite cheap in Australia. The cost of a of a PSMA PET was uh, costed at around twelve hundred Australian dollars, uh, which is I think that's around eight hundred uh, US dollars. And uh, our listeners from the US will be covering their ears. <laughs> How can you do a PET scan for that sort of money? It costs sort of five to tenfold that of money. Uh, here. So uh, it is interesting to compare the costs uh, in different countries and think about why we have uh, such uh, discrepancies. But I think that might also reflect the cost of conventional imaging in these countries to more expensive CT scans, bone scans, MR scans. Uh, so the comparison might not be all that different. The cost of treatment, of course, in the US is very high as well. So if you're going to increase the cost of treatment by having a delayed diagnosis and more complex treatment, then it's then those downstream costs are going to be increased as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had two other papers which I were done, presented actually by my uh, 
German colleagues, but I was a, a co-author. We looked at uh, prognostic markers for overall survival and outcome in patients having uh, lutetium uh, PSMA uh, treatment and uh, another paper by the same sort of group uh, looking at outcomes in patients with diffuse marrow involvement like PSMA super scans oh, where your whole yeah. marrow is infiltrated with marrow with a disease where you may be uh, scared or worried to use uh, lutetium therapy. And we showed that it's, uh, you know, the toxicity is a little bit higher in that group, but it still seems uh, very safe uh, and effective. So that was, that was a, a nice kind of multi-center data set where we got uh, uh, a retrospective data set, but patients that had had lutetium PSMA therapy in uh, several centers in Germany, our center at Peter Mac, and also some centers in, uh, in, in the US. And these are not that common, these patients with diffuse marrow involvement, but we were able to bring together 44 patients uh, with a sort of PSMA super scan. So that was a it nice... It wasn't sort of an argument that, that you use alpha therapy in these people, wouldn't you? So wasn't that fair? Yeah, alpha therapy would definitely be, uh, you know, of interest in that in this group. But, you know, beta therapy also is safe. Yeah, so right. the same, maybe your marrow is located far enough away from the tumour that even with a one millimetre path length with lutetium, you know, it's uh, reasonably well tolerated. So was there a survival, what, did you show a survival benefit in, uh, in the other paper that you presented with them in, in, in terms of the lutetium therapy? Uh, look, really hard to, sh in, uh, in our randomised trial with carbazitaxel, the, uh, that's the sort of data we need for survival, a, a comparison arm rather than single arm uh, yeah. data. And uh, we don't yet have the survival data on that cohort just because the follow-up hasn't been uh, long enough, but uh, you know we do hope with a bit more follow-up that we will, you know, be able to show a survival analysis. But we've only had actually, you know, less than a hundred deaths out of the two hundred patients in that study uh, right. to date, which is just insufficiently powered. So it hasn't actually triggered the uh, calculation for survival yet in that study. Okay, good. Mm. Um, and um, you did some. You said there's some AI stuff as well. We did do some AI stuff. So uh, Price Jackson, who's our uh, medical uh, physicist at Peter Mac, uh, uh, together in a collaboration actually with some colleagues who have an interest in AI at uh, King's College in London at St. Thomas's Pet Centre, where I did a, a pet fellowship uh, back in 2006. Uh, we looked at uh, a developing a tool for AI-driven organ segmentation and quantification of uptake on dotatate uh, PET scans. Uh, so dotatate PET scans are typically read by something called the Kroening score, where you look at the uptake compared to normal uh, liver uptake and normal uh, spleen uptake. Uh, so our physicists and uh, computer science colleagues uh, developed a tool to contour the liver and spleen on the CT scan, which is a fairly easy task. Uh, grab the SUVs, but then also uh, contour all the tumors automatically and then be able to correlate it uh, to those organs uh, in a similar way to us humans uh, read these uh, uh, studies. And it was a, you know, we got some dotatate PET scans from uh, Peter Mac and fed them into this and at least, you know, showed that it's uh, quite feasible to do. So I think we, we both have an interest in AI image interpretation. I think it's going to be a, a huge area of uh, development in the next uh, decade. Uh, I think computers, you know, some of my clinical colleagues, or when I speak to my radiology colleagues, they're really scared of uh, artificial intelligence imaging. They think they might be working their way on themselves out of a job, but, you know, I, uh, yeah. I can't wait for the day when the computer can well, sit there and read the scan in five seconds. And I just have to go, yes, that, that's correct. Tick. Cause I think we'll still have a, a human doing the, the interpretation or finalizing uh, at the bottom, but I think computers will, uh, be a lot more accurate and sophisticated than us uh, human readers. And a little bit of uh, uh, assistance is, is what we need. We have uh, bad days where we didn't get much sleep and we have to go into work and report a huge volume of PET scans. And uh, I would much rather have a computer second checking uh, everything that I do. Uh, but I think the computers are also going to pick up a lot of stuff that we can't even see. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I think... I think on the PET and the CT. Yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's two areas where that works. I think you, you gave a terrific example there, and it's really low-hanging fruit. 
Um, I mean, you're going to go and uh, draw reads of interest around thousands of little metastases? No. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's just really laborious and hard to do. Like computers, are wonderful at doing those tedious tedious jobs. So that's a that's an obvious low hanging fruit one. But but yes, I think the computers can see things. I mean, just in terms of the dynamic range of what you can see with your eyes. I mean, the computer has just got and and a computer can, of course can can see all all dimensions of an image all at once, where you can only see them in two, uh, really well in two. You do two D slices. So so there's lots of ways in which a computer can help you. And of course, computers aren't very good at, at chatting to patients and explaining them how their theranostics are going to work. So, so there's, you know, there's, there's an absolute role for, for communicating information, which I think humans are still going to have a bit of a role to play there, I think. Yeah, and we've got a big interest in uh, AI with our PSMA PET. And I think one of the big challenges with deep learning uh, algorithms are having robust clinical data sets that are annotated. Uh, it's no use having a thousand or 5,000 studies that you've performed just as routine clinical care that are just a hodgepodge of patients, non-homogeneous group, uh, no definitive outcome measure for the computer to compare to. So one of the spin-off of uh, pro-PSMA and therapy and these other multi-centre trials that we're doing in Australia is that we have really neat data sets that are specific group of patients and uh, also, as part of these clinical trials, we've done some uh, validation on the PET cameras at baseline to make sure that the SUVs were accurate. And uh, we've got some QC around radiopharmaceutical production. So they're, you know, good quality PET scans. And then we've got a follow-up variable, which could just be survival, as simple as how long did the patient live? And then you can throw in all the baseline scans, know exactly this group of patients with these characteristics, throw in survival and get the computer to work backwards and see if it can pick a characteristic on those scans that uh, determine survival. And I think unless you've got high quality, almost clinical trial data, it's really, really difficult to do that. Uh, so we're working uh, you know, on that in the background and hopefully we'll have some good data in the next few years. Well, in many ways, we actually destroy data when we reconstruct it to show it to, a, to a someone to read. Um, um, we, doctors are not very good at handling noisy data, for example. So, yeah, I don't read the sinogram data. Exactly. You can't read the sinogram data very well. Um, so, or, the, or even the uh, prompts of the detectors, whereas computers are quite good at reading the actual data that comes straight out of the scanner. So that means that you're not, you're not uh, degrading the information before, uh, before, you, before it gets analysed. And I think there's a lot of basic information. And, you know, we've, we've been showing that a lot of basic information that, that, that that, it can, that it's, that's in the scan that you simply don't don't that you remove by processing it to to normal viewing standards. So if you're starting with normal viewing images, I think you're losing a lot of the information. You need to have you need to de, you need to design your PET scan around the computer who's reading it, not the person who's reading it. Yeah. So in your research studies, or uh, since you do a lot of you know brain research, do you store all the Raw data for all the patients, or did you well, just... absolutely all the raw data since 2012? We've kept every bit of raw data we've ever had. Um, we can re reconstruct, and we do often re reconstruct. Um, um, you images. might find that's very useful when you come to do the AI. Absolutely. Um, so we put we've got a pet reconstructor in the cloud, and and that means that we can also re reconstruct our pet scans thousands of times. Um, each PET scan and, and work out what the optimal way to reconstruct a scan is for, for a particular outcome. And that's useful in layer as well. So, um, you know, I think uh, that's, that's the way we're going. And I think, I think uh, we, our big data is getting easier to get hold of and, and easier to work with. Um, but it needs but garbage in, garbage out. If you don't do your, if you, if you, if you don't write down the time of your injection and the time of the scan and the uptake time and the, and the uh, the age of the patient and the blood test result and everything correctly. If it's if it's scrawled on a bit of paper rather than correctly digitally co captured, all of those little bits and pieces go towards making reproducible data, which makes it much easier for a computer to understand. Yeah, and we had two other presentations at EANM on uh, lutetium dosimetry. This was by uh, uh, John Violet, one of our radiation oncology colleagues, and it's rather sad because. Uh, he passed away a few weeks ago and uh, 
He had actually recorded his e a and m presentations being a virtual meeting, and then two weeks after he recorded his presentations, he you know unexpectedly you know, passed away. This is a really close colleague of mine who uh, really designed the first lutetium p s m a uh, co uh, study with me back in 2004. Uh, he's a radiation oncologist who trained in the UK at, and uh, did a PhD out at Royal Free on radio immunotherapy. So, unlike his radiation oncology colleagues that are all into external beam, uh, he was unusual. He really liked uh, uh, theranostics and he would come and play with us in, in nuclear medicine. And uh, so, uh, you know, in, in ordinary times, his presentations would have never happened. Uh, so it's a sign of the strange uh, COVID times. Uh, so I put a little uh, epilogue on the end of his uh, uh, talks, uh, you know, so rather so sad circumstances, but uh, some really nice talks on uh, his work in dosimetry and Letitia PSMA. And really what we uh, looked at was uh, dose to all of prostate cancer tumor dose and an outcome measure like dropping PSA. Yep. Uh, traditional dosimetry has been rather simplistic. You would kind of take a patient with metastatic disease and maybe pick the hottest spot and go, yep, that got uh, 20 gray or 50 gray and then look, well, how did, you know, what, what was the response? But when you got 20 or 30 metastases, one spot's not really representative at all. So a bit like a tumor metabolic volume on a FDG PET scan. Uh, we just took the SPECT scan, the quantitative SPECT CT, uh, after treating a patient with lutetium and put a contour around all of the tumor automatically, uh, very similar to how you would do a MTV on a PET scan, and then asked uh, the computer, what's the average radiation dose in that whole tumor volume? And then we compared that with our uh, uh, PSA response at 12 weeks. And we actually found that if you got less than 10 gray on average to the whole tumor burden, there were 10 non-responders and only one patient responded. So a huge uh, differentiation based on uh, dosimetry, which is uh, what we would expect. But I think it's you know one of the neat first times we've been able to show such a tight correlation between uh, dosimetry uh, and an outcome measure. And also a nice feature of doing a prospective trial where you've got a homogeneous group of group patients and, and good follow-up. I think, you know, another weakness of, of theranostics in the past has been a lot of retrospective data where it's just really hard to tease these things out. Right. So are we aiming for a, a maximum tolerable dose so that we, so that we get rid of all, I mean, it's that low uptake, uh, uh, small side of tumor that, that may not get so much uptake is the one that's going to uh, metastasize later on. Uh, in some ways. So, so are we looking for a more dissymmetry on everybody so we can give a maximum tolerable dose rather than a one size fits all? That's the aim. It's not so easy to achieve in, in uh, clinical practice, particularly if you want to do high volume uh, uh, theranostics. And, uh, you know, it is a complex area uh, because there's just so many factors from tumor rate sensitivity to off target effects. Uh, it is, uh, it is really difficult. Uh, uh, I think the, the more I do therapy, the kind of, the more I like dosimetry, particularly for development of these uh, new theranostics. But once you want to roll it out on a practical level to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people across the world, I think it can be advantageous to, you know, not do the, dos not to right. the dosimetry, which really slows you down and makes it a bit impractical. Right, but maybe your advances in, in, in deep learning might help with that. Because, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, deep learning might be a great way to deal with that theranostic issue in terms of uh, being able to push in, in your images and get you, a, um, and get you a dose out the other end without too much bother. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, yep, and that definitely another application of you know, deep learning in the future. Uh, you may be able to take your baseline imaging and, uh, you know, get a preferred administered activity to give the patient based on both normal organ uptake and tumour uptake. Right. Um, do, 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 in your experience, do you find that, um, that, a, that a high dose uh, has too many side effects or, or 
or or can you give everyone a high dose so that you don't have to worry about maximum double dose? You're going to give a dose that's going to get rid of it anyway, and you're not going to worry so much. I mean, is is that is that practical in in in, in nutrition? I think it's it's not that practical, but we definitely see this correlation. So no doubt, if we get really high dose to the parotid glands, we'll see dry mouth. If we get low dose, we won't see dry mouth. Uh, the tumor thresholds, if we get above a certain dose, you know, the tumors are obliterated and 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 they will shrink with a a very high degree of certainty. Uh, but you know, that's in retrospect. That's post hoc dosimetry after you've treated the patient. To be able to do that and adjust the dose before you treat is feasible. It's just not that practical. You know, we have a colleague actually that trained at, uh, did, trained at Peter Mackin has gone back to Canada and has really individualized lutetium doses for neuroendocrine tumor, he presented a paper where uh, he gave up to 35 gigabecquerels of lutetium for a single treatment uh, based on the uh, dosimetry, uh, showing that it would be safe for that and, and low adverse effects. But you know, that's not that practical when you look at the costs of 35 gigabecquerels of lutetium, a typical dose that we treat with is like 7.5. That would be one treatment costing as much as five treatments. And these are not the cheapest therapy. So the, you know, I think there's a, there are some pragmatic limitations to optimizing our treatment. And also we should bear in mind, we have this luxury that we can see what we treat both before and oh. with dosimetry. That's really great, but it's no different to any other drug. You know, even chemotherapy or pembrolizumab immunotherapy, it's all the same concept. And our oncology colleagues or cardiology co colleagues, when they're dosing hypertensive drugs, they never try to individualize doses the way we try to do in, in nuclear medicine. Uh, but it's exactly the same concepts, uh, particularly with antibodies that bind to tumors. In theory, if you've got a larger burden of tumor, you need a yeah. larger burden of antibody. But I'm not aware of any you know, cold antibody therapy that's dosed according to tumor burden, even though that may be optimal, they dose it just according to body weight. So all these principles are actually relevant for non-nuclear medicine as well. If anything, maybe sometimes we get a bit carried away uh, in nuclear medicine, trying to hyper-optimize, which is the ideal, uh, but we run into some feasibility issues. Right, you don't, you don't want the perfect to be the enemy, enemy of the better. Um, Correct. If we aim for perfect, then it won't be a treatment that we can just roll out easily. Right. But, I mean, again, what you're saying, I mean, we've got to think about how we can optimize, use PET for those other purposes. You talked about immunotherapies. I mean, we need longer-lived PET traces so that we can follow immunotherapies through and see whether those are going to... Um, uh, they're, they're, getting, they're engaging the target and, uh, and, uh, and you've got the right, uh, the right therapy. I mean, that, that's part of what we need, but we need traces that ideally... You know, F18 is not ideal for, 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 for measuring the immune response, right? It just doesn't sit in the body long enough. Correct. And, and also, maybe we can just learn a lot from nuclear medicine and translate it back to oncology clinics. So now that we do have tools to do a metabolic tumor volume very robustly on a PET scan, uh, you can now quite easily, particularly once you've got a deep learning tool that does it almost instantly for you, if you can give that information back to the oncologist to say, this patient has 750 mils of tumor. Well, maybe they can suddenly dose their drug according to tumor burden, which they could never do in the past and take the same drug and really optimize outcome by not dosing according to body weight, but dosing according to what the hell they should be dosing it. You know, there is potential to do that in the future. I think money might drive that. These immunotherapies are, are wickedly expensive, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. So on first principles, it stands to reason that if you've got a small burden of tumor you only need a little tiny dose of your pembrolizumab and if you got big burden of tumor you need a lot more uh, but i'm not aware of anyone in the oncology community who's really kind of thinking that way uh, but i think we, we this is the value we bring combining imaging into oncology yeah sounds great let's get on with it <laughs> <laughs> right um anything else you'd like to mention about the air in, in terms of uh, things or, or stuff that's going on uh, no, it's an exciting meeting. Again, shame that we can't all get together in Vienna. I don't think we'd want to be there this year, but uh, we are getting all a bit virtual meetings uh, fatigue, I think. Uh, I am now looking forward to uh, going back to some meetings and actually 
bumping into people and, and catching up uh, properly and also having at least a short break from work as you go to these conferences. Now I'm just working every day and tuning into EANM at night and listening to, to a little bit of content. Yeah. Uh, but I think we're all going to get a bit exhausted if we continue that. Yeah, uh, and not only that, working from home means you never leave work. Yeah. So, so, so you and and because the meetings are virtually A and S and M, you are working twenty four hours a day, and that's just not sustainable. Yeah. So fact, hopefully, we we'll can see them afterwards. So that helps a bit. Yeah. You got anything exciting coming up in terms of meetings? Coming up, uh, look, I feel like I'm doing a virt I feel like I'm doing a virtual meeting about once a week at the moment. In the last <laughs> month, I've been to Vienna. Uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, India, uh, and uh, Amsterdam. Uh, so uh, I'm starting to say, no, I can't attend this meeting. That's the other downside of a virtual meeting is if I was asked to speak in India, if I couldn't get there physically, I would just send my apologies. Now it's easier to say, uh, oh, yes, I'll attend. And uh, yeah, I'm losing track of all the meetings that I'm attending. Yeah, true. All right. Well, um, uh, thanks for being part of the podcast. I think that we've given a lot of food for thought. If, if someone who's listening to it wants to pick up some of the ideas we've had, uh, please uh, get in touch with us because I think uh, I think there's a lot that can be done and um, and and we're a bit lucky in, in Australia that we can get on and do it now, I think, because I think our clinics are opening up, but we've got down to a point where we're, not likely to see a resurgence of COVID because we've got it down to zero. New Zealand also, even better, right? So, so, um, so, um, so hopefully we can do some things. And we've also noticed, I don't know about, about uh, in oncology, but in, in neurology, a lot of the studies that have been asked that, that were started in, in the US and Europe are moving to Australia for that very reason. And we're continuing them here. Do you find that? Is that something that you're seeing happening? Uh, look, I, initially when we had the first lockdown, uh, you know, I run a lot of studies and they were all either paused or slowed down. Uh, I think our institution has, uh, you know, picked up on that. So our research volumes are probably, you know, back to normal uh, and now even right around Australia, which is uh, fantastic. So, you know, we never shut down our trials completely. So the research uh, continues. Uh, I think, you know, we, 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 we can't, let, we can't stop everything and uh, hopefully we can keep the numbers down now so that we don't need to but we have seen an effect where uh, people were not going to their doctors when they had symptoms uh, and I think in the last two to three weeks uh, we are seeing a perhaps a, a bit of a tsunami of advanced cancer presentations coming to our hospital our oncologists are noting this uh, I think this is a rather sad second or third order effect of COVID-19 that either either people didn't feel comfortable leaving their home to go to their general practitioner because they didn't want to get infected, didn't want to expose themselves, uh, or they were elderly, didn't, weren't comfortable with telehealth, so didn't go to their doctor, uh, or the outpatient clinics in the hospital shut down so they weren't able to. Uh, so there's no doubt that we, I think we're going to see a little bit of a ramp up in uh, cancer diagnoses, but other things as well, cardiovascular disease, uh, which, you know, we, we do need to think about carefully. Yeah, well, because people are perhaps not exercising as much, although one of the reasons to get out in Melbourne was to exercise. So maybe that's maybe that's helped, I think, in some respects. Uh, but but I think uh, uh, hopefully um, hopefully we'll be able to get on top of this and uh, and make some lemons out of lemonade in terms of that and, uh, and, and get some stuff done. Um, thanks again for taking part in the podcast. I really appreciate Great it. To and, uh, and we'll catch up again soon uh, in person. I've enjoyed chatting to you. It's been okay. a great podcast as always. Great, thanks. Cheers.